My name is Karen Newroar with the Oklahoma State University Library. Today is Tuesday, November the 6th, 2007, and I'm at the home of John Cooper interviewing John and some friends. It's being, the interview is being conducted as part of Remembering Wilma Elizabeth McDaniel, Poet and Oklahoma Dust Bowl Immigrant Oral History Project for the OSU Library. Thank you for joining us today, John. Thank you. I like the word Dust Bowl Immigrant. That's, that's kind of, that's an apt description. Well, thank you. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself. Are you from Oklahoma originally? I was born and raised in Oklahoma City. Um, high school, junior high, the whole, you know, living in the suburbs of outside of town. Uh, came to Stillwater, Oklahoma in the spring, fall of 1976 to go to Oklahoma State University. Um, through a series of events, got a degree. <laughs> By mistake, mostly, but... Um, uh, achieved a degree in 1982, um, what else, various odd jobs, I taught high school in Oklahoma City in the late 80s and early 90s at Capitol Hill High School, um, I quit that in the spring of 1993 to become a member of the Red Dirt Rangers full time, that's what I've done since then. Okay, for the interview purposes, the Red Dirt Rangers, a little bit about uh, it. It's a band of people that I came in contact with. Uh, I met the principal guys here in Stillwater um, through mutual friends. Uh, we inhabited a place called The Farm, which was outside of town, and which well, I'm sure we'll do a, another huge oral history of at some point, right? Yeah, because there's way too much to talk about there at, at this time, but I lived at a place called The Farm, which was, um, uh, it was on 149 acres just to the west of town, Sanger Road. Uh, we lived out there, we took, we moved in in the spring of 79, summer of 79. Mm -hmm. And for the next 20 years, that was the place for a lot of stuff, but music in particular came out there because of the freedom that was attached. And I met Bradley Piccolo and Bob Wiles who we started um, the beginnings of the Red Dirt Rangers in the early 80s, actually. Didn't perform until later on, but I digress. Uh, <laughs> we're talking about, uh, we're talking how did the band start? Mm -hmm. okay. um, just through a series of uh, playing together at homes in Oklahoma City, we actually all kind of gathered in Oklahoma City. A few of us would get together after work and on weekends to play music. And that developed into Red Dirt Rangers, which began in the late 80s, early 90s, which has continued for the last 19 years. And the type of music? Red Dirt music, of course. Could you explain that? To uh, you? A little, yes. Uh, I would. I call Red Dirt, Rain, uh, Red Dirt music really a conglomeration of all the musics that we heard. We didn't want to pick a particular style, so we, we, we play and listen to bluegrass, blues, rock and roll, swing, Jazz, I mean, Tex-Mex, Cajun, the palette is large. We draw from a large palette. Um, it gets lumped in with country music, but there, and there are strong, strong elements of country music, but we challenge people to listen to it and decide what they think it is. Okay. Well, thank you for a good background there. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's talk about Wilma Elizabeth McDaniel. Um, when did you first meet her? Uh, I can tell you the exact date. It was October 24th, 1998. We were in, uh, we had taken the band uh, from Oklahoma. Uh, we were going out to California to tour. Uh, and one of the first shows we played was an event called Dust Bowl Days in Weed Patch, California, which is a mile south of Bakersfield and was an original migrant camp for um, Okies and displaced people, displaced immigrants from this area, Kansas, you know, Texas, Oklahoma, all through here, the Dust Bowl region. Um, that's where they went to go out there to, to pick fruit, pick fruit vegetables throughout the, uh, I believe it's the San Fernando Valley. Is that correct? Central Valley. Central, San Joaquin. San Joaquin. San Joaquin Valley, the Central Valley. So as part of the huge migration of that, uh, of those people, they had to have camps, and this was a place with, 
1998, we were asked to come play. Um, of course, most of the people who originally had moved there were deceased, and it was their kids. You know, none of the, the real adults were left. Uh, but we were contacted to play this event, and um, through Doris, remember Doris's name? I can't either. Doris contacted us, but uh, uh, we'd met our friend Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz uh, before that through a film, which we did a score for, which could be another thing to talk about. But uh, we'd met Roxanne and she said, oh, you gotta come out. She got her name to those to the people out there, Doris in particular. And they were, we were contacted to come play this event, which was really nice. Uh, it was really a cool place. Uh, as part of it, Wilma was going to speak, and I guess read poetry. I don't remember exactly, but she was, uh, uh, I guess, contracted to come out and speak or contacted, and she came as well. And so we hooked up with Roxanne, and, and she introduced us to Wilma, which was an interesting experience from the very first. She, you know, it was just, uh, or do you want me to go on about her from here? Okay. Keep talking. Uh, Wilma was very plain spoken and very just, you know, uh, I think she was in a wheelchair at the time, in and out, wasn't she? Walker. Walker, wheelchair. She had some aid to walk, but her uh, her manner was very oaky. That's a, I, of course, that's easy to say, but uh, it was very down to earth. And she acted like she, you know, there was no real meeting. It was just kind of a picking up and going on from where she talked with guys like us all her life, I'm sure. But um, it was just interesting to talk to her. Uh, I met her first and was talking to her. We came her, she said, uh, well, let's go. I had to go to the stage to start setting stuff up. And so she went with me and she goes, well, I want to meet the rest of these dudes. I haven't been introduced to them yet. And so they, everybody introduced themselves and it was just a very easy meeting. She seemed very comfortable and at home with us, and we did with her as well. The same way that it had been with Roxanne, who we'd met originally. Um, you know, it. they had both gone to California, but the mannerism and the, the way they approached people was very um, easy and open. And that's just what really struck me about Wilma. Um, just her openness and her just ease of being around people, especially people she knew as from Oklahoma or from this part of the country. There was just a natural affinity that, um, you know, that she put out for those people because these were, we were her people. Her people were here and in California and she was kind of a mother matriarch figure to a lot of them, including us and anybody else that, you know, came in contact with her. So. The, the, the initial meeting was very easy and very simple. Mm -hmm. So what was the, um, was the festival multiple days then? It was actually one day. Uh, the, we were only there one day, mm -hmm. and we were set up on the back of a flatbed trailer. Um, we played for a while, and it was funny to look out into a sea of faces that looked familiar. You know, it just was. We knew those people, and they knew us, and... You know, uh, they came up saying, oh, do you know so-and-so that lives in Watonga? It's like, well, no, not really. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Everybody knew somebody. And it turned out, I know Brad, found we found people that knew people that we knew pretty quick. It didn't take long in that crowd. You know, oh, yeah, my people are from Medford, this and that, or whatever. So it was easy to relate with the folks. Uh, we played for a while, and Wilma got up to speak i guess just to kind of talk a little bit did she i can't remember she read that day or she read it yeah i i didn't remember exactly but uh and i'm, I'm sure brad relayed this story about um she asked if we knew karina and we karina karina and we said no we don't really know it but she goes oh that's my favorite song and who this, was that by originally uh bob wills is who i heard it by originally it's probably 100 years old. yeah it, it's probably an old blues tune but she asked if we knew it. We said, no, we don't. But, you know, it's a great song and this and that. And so she got up to speak and read her poem and uh, introduced us again and said, and now the boys are going to do one of my favorite numbers, Karina, Karina. <laughs> and so we all looked at each other just going, oh, boy, here we go, you know. So we launched into it because it's, I mean, we knew the tune. We just didn't know all the words. And Brad knew some of the words. 
started in and our friend and man made at the time, Benny Craig, came in and knew the rest of it. So we kind of pulled it off and it went real well, but that was just a, you know, Wilma wanted Karina Karina and she was going to have it and she got it. So that was it. Did you look at her while you were singing? Uh, she was just kind of there to the side, tapping her foot and enjoying herself. You know, she acted like it was no big deal. Like we should know Karina because we're from Oklahoma and that's the way it is. She was right. We didn't know it. We just didn't know we knew it. You remember if she was mouthing the words along with it? I don't. I was, you know, we were kind of so petrified as having to pull up a song we never played that we didn't really, I wasn't watching her much. But everybody seemed to enjoy it. I know she got a kick out of it. And I guess we spent a few more hours with her that day. And, you know, I'm sure she tired pretty quickly. And so uh, they took her on home. But out of that one meeting, um, I know I kept in contact and Brad and his wife Lisa did as well for the next 10 years uh, just from meeting her that one time and Roxanne was always you know we would run into her and stayed in, had contact with her as well who had contact with Wilma but I got to a point where I would at time you know I was living out here by myself Brad was recently married and I was kind of getting into a trailer and I live out here in the middle of nowhere Lone Chimney, Oklahoma. You can't find it on any map, folks. Don't look. Uh, so I would just call. I had her number, and I just would call her occasionally. And she would love the descriptions of the land because she loved it back here. You know, she always remembered it. It was her. This was the old home country for her. So her and I had a phone thing where I would call her every few weeks. And then she began writing letters. Uh, I've got some of which I've have several and treasure them and I know uh, Brad and his wife were sending pictures and we were sending CDs and she was you know we were just had communication through the mail mm -hmm. and through telephone I would really like talking to them on the phone just to hear her voice and to hear you know her remembrances of being back here she had real vivid and very clear memories of her time in Oklahoma this was her treasured youth you know and just would talk about a lot of the stuff back here, her Cherokee cousins and the men she knew and the women she knew and growing up in this part of the state. And just, you know, it was a, it was, I think she enjoyed talking to me because all that would come flooding back for her. You know, it helped her remember by describing it to me. And I really enjoyed that because I was getting some vivid stuff. Well, tell me what you can remember about her family. Did she spend most of her early years in and around Stroud? You know, I don't, I don't really know Wilma's history that great. What I do know is that at the age of, I believe it was 17, is when she was uprooted. Was it not 17? I think it was 17. Because she, she said she was, I'm almost positive she told me she was 17, when they just uprooted and took everybody and they all went west. And how did she feel about that? Oh, she was very sad by it. She felt like she was being ripped out of, you know, this is all she'd ever known and, and didn't want to go. I think a lot of them probably didn't, but her family was going and knew that she had to. Um, and I think the fact she left at that age was very crucial for her. 17 is a very developmental. I mean, there's a lot going on at the age of 17. Your world is kind of changing. You're being thrust into adulthood. You know, there's just a lot of change in, in people at that age. And here she is being uprooted and moved 1,500 miles west. Um, so I think it was a profound time for her. You know, it's what really seared into her memory. Mm -hmm. And Wilma, as we all know, has a very, has and had a very vivid memory and vivid imagination. She could, her writing showed that a lot. So uh, I think it was a big, big deal for her having to leave people that she knew she'd never see again. And in talking with other women that I know lived through that same era, my grandmother in particular, she said the same thing. It was, she lost friends that she never heard or saw from again. They just vanished hmm. and went West. And I think that was traumatic for people here and th that left mm -hmm. both a profound effect on them and the state, both states. Um, and made an interconnectedness between here and California and up the West Coast as well, Oregon into Washington. You know, there's a real link for people out there to here and vice versa, which is great. Um, 
but especially from this part of the country. Did she talk about her family at all? Not really, just some. She talked mostly about her youth with me. Uh, in fact, I was, Roxanne just recently told me that she had a sister she was very tight with. And I think I'd heard her mention her sister, but it didn't make that much of a mark on me. My relationship with Wilma was her relating to her past and being here. She liked talking with me about her time here when she was a kid and those early days in California. And also the the people in California that would come to her and as she would do readings would be comforted by the readings that she'd do because they had become as children or their parents had always talked about Oklahoma. And I think those people talk about this part of the country like the Italian immigrants in New York and the East Coast talk about Italy or the old country. It was Oklahoma was... Italy to the displaced immigrants, as you call them, mm -hmm. in New York and Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. It was just, uh, you know, they longed for the old country. Mm -hmm. So that was my relationship with her, with her, was talking about the old days. Mm -hmm. How long were your phone conversations usually? They could go very long at times. Um, you know, when she get on a roll... I'd let her go, and, and and I could roll back, you know, with some of what I had, but I just mostly like listening to her, mm -hmm. her descriptions of the people here, her relatives, her cousins, you know, people she hung out with, the townspeople and the places she lived, the places she traveled around Oklahoma and saw. She had relatives all, in fact, she knew this country, uh, Pawnee County and Payne County. She had uh, relatives that were in Pawnee, and they would come up, you know, a couple times a year, just people visited a little more back in those days, mm -hmm. pack the family and go visit. Maybe not, but um, they still do a lot. But she would talk about coming to this country and how much she enjoyed it. What other places um, do you know of that she lived? Stroud is really all I know that she actually lived here. There may have been other places and you might be privy to that, but I'm not really. Just you know, I think it was Stroud. Like I said, she they had relatives all over central and north central Oklahoma mm -hmm. and eastern just kind of this north central eastern swath mm -hmm. and they did a lot of visiting so did she talk about the town of Stroud at all um a little bit not a whole lot not a whole lot they lived outside of town uh from what I could gather so um she was more of a country girl and town wasn't really in her mm -hmm. thing did that she, I could tell. Did she talk about the journey to California? They take old Route 66? Good question. I don't really remember ever talking about the journey. Mm -hmm. It was just being here and then all this, then being there. Being there. Yeah. And what did she do after she um, went to California? Uh, let's see. For, uh, from what I could gather, she, I know she, she sharecropped or they, she worked in the fields with the family. Uh, she was never formally educated, she didn't go to college. Um, in fact, she wasn't published until her mid fifties. I want to say she wrote, she wrote poetry here as a child. And this is one thing she would talk about. She'd write here. She was always writing things down and had a lot of stuff from here. And when she went to California, continued that, continued to always keep her feelings in journals. And I think it was poetry. I don't know if it was journals or not, but, um, just kept that stuff and didn't publish it, didn't try to do anything with it. And I don't know the exact story. Roxanne can relate that to you better, I'm sure, of exactly how she got seen. So a professor somewhere saw her stuff, or a, I think an editor of a newspaper, and read through it and was just like blown away and said, wow, this is amazing, and got it to the right people, and like I say, in her mid-50s. So, which is really a good time for poets to flourish anyway life experience they can kind of you know have a lot to draw from by that point although she'd been writing her entire life and she had stuff she could go way back for so so she saved everything that she wrote yeah i think she did uh, i don't know that for sure but i would venture to say she saved everything do you think her parents encouraged her i think they did yeah uh i don't think they really thought that much about it it was just something she did and that's what she kind of alluded to mm -hmm. this is just something i do and I write. Mm. And, that, and that's the, the one thing that's really beautiful about Wilma is that she never really, you know, I don't think she ever went out to say, oh, I'm going to be a poet or I'm going to, 
I want to be a writer or this or that. She just did that. It's just something she did. So it was a way of her explaining the world, you know, to herself, if nobody else. Mm -hmm. Did she send you poems? Some, mostly letters. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I do have a poem or two. I, I was kind of going through some stuff I didn't, I've still got some stuff I haven't looked through everything, but uh, mostly it was just letters and some of the descriptions are beautiful. I mean, I'll keep them in here or I could even read them if you want. That'd be good. Sure. Sure. Let me get to them. Or just, yeah, one or two. Yeah, I'll just give a little overview of some of the letters. Where's that pretty letters? There's just a couple that are really kind of expressive stuff. Let's see here. Um, here's just a quick one. It was surely a pleasure to talk to you last night. Genuine Oki style visiting. You mentioned maybe cooking up a little something later in the evening and I immediately smelled frying potatoes. <laughs> it was just, you know, there's another one that I really liked here. Did you see, there was the one I was reading to you earlier about the, uh, the stars. That was beautiful, beautiful description. Well, I don't see the hair. Ah, the jewel was hiding. Here it is. Uh, it was a pleasure to receive your call last night, be connected with Oklahoma in such a meaningful way. It recalled velvety nights with stars so low we could probably have plucked one from the sky uh, if we stirred ourselves. <laughs> I just like that description. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, to me, that's poetry. I mean, that's just beautiful stuff. Where are you going to get that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right here, ladies and gentlemen, that's where. <laughs> But yeah, the correspondence was fun, and I really enjoy the letters, and now especially more than ever, because mm -hmm. I can just tune right back in. Do you think she preferred talking on the phone or writing? I think she liked both. Mm -hmm. You know, um, with me it was both, and I enjoyed doing both. You know, having them both with her. I sent her a few letters, not near as many as she sent me, because she just liked to write. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so I, but I think both. She liked the conversation. Um, and that's, you know, it's a beautiful part, you know, and she, that's the funny thing with her is as Roxanne will relate, she had relationships with people for years in which she only met once for a short time, in some cases, never at all, just correspondence and uh, learning about each other through poetry and writing. And, and that's how you really know someone. There's a lot. I mean, you bear your soul when you write. So. You can know when someone as intimately through their writing and never having have met them as knowing them and being around them all their lives, I think. Mm -hmm. um, do you know of other people she corresponded with, or kept in touch with? Well, uh, guys in my band, Brad and Lisa Piccolo. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. I know she kept in contact. There was a, a woman, a, a lady in Stroud, and Roxanne might recall her name that uh, was instrumental in getting a, a room or an area of the Stroud Library named for Wilma that she kept in contact with and would come and see us occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, but that was about it back here. After, by the time I'd met her, she lost contact with virtually everyone back here. A few people mm -hmm. that I knew of, but not really many. Okay. Did you ever see her again? Never saw her again, one time. Three, four hours, mm -hmm. that's it. But didn't have to. Mm -hmm. I saw her once. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Knew what she looked like. Do you have any, um, did she send poetry to you? Uh, you know, I, I'll have to look. I think there is some poetry. I just, it's been a while since I've been through those letters. Mm -hmm. It's been 10 years, mm -hmm. eight years. But I love some of her poetry. Do you have favorites? I do have favorites. 
Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about this book, though. This was one that um, you know, she, she wrote a lot of poetry books, and she would send them to me. And uh, she'd send them, well, Brad and Lisa would get them, too, and we'd all get them. And, you know, this one, it's called Getting Love Down Right. And uh, I was looking through it and reading the poetry and really enjoying it and kind of tossed it on my coffee table. And I looked on the back, and there I was kissing her hand and what well, is a very strange moment. I think it's when we first met, but and then she has this courtly young men poem that goes with it. That was kind of just kind of a mind blower. Do you remember that incident or who took the picture? No, I have no idea. I mean, I don't. I didn't even remember this. Oh. Really? Mm-hmm. I mean, it just happened. It was one of those. You know, that it looked even though it might look staged, <laughs> it's not. That just happened. I mean, I had no idea when anybody was shooting a picture, mm-hmm. and she's got a big smile on her face and a big hat. But yeah, that was. Uh, Back in 98. But yeah, I do have a favorite poem, and I would like to read it. I just like this. It was, one, I think, the one that first struck me, and it's called Pursued. They hang around my life like a mantle, but why should these names follow me from a place where I was wrenched so long ago? I cannot say, and will never know, why they whisper their Oklahoma names in my ear. Blue Jacket, Atoka. Watonga, Boggy Depot, Shoto, Poto, Rush Springs, Shamrock. And when there is a moment's silence, I hear Kellyville, Tishomingo, Pretty Water, Paul's Valley. I just like that, man. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, she's right. The names are beautiful and real descriptive. And um, that's the first poem of hers that really struck man that is really cool I think the word wrenched is yeah pretty pivotal exactly absolutely a place where I was wrenched so long ago I mean that says a lot doesn't it she didn't like leaving mm-hmm. yeah. beautiful stuff um, what kind of topics did she enjoy discussing Oklahoma, of course, but can you be a little more specific? Uh, uh, well, like I said, uh, one thing that uh, we had a band member, Benny Craig, who was, uh, he was, uh, I think, half blood, half, half Cherokee, half blood Cherokee. And she, Wilma was also Cherokee. And Benny toured with us out there and she met him and, you know, we would talk about him. She really took to him immediately because she said he reminded her of her Cherokee cousins. Great big guys. He was a ro- Benny was a rodeo cowboy. Uh, excellent, ro- world class rodeo cowboy. He was a world class, in my opinion, fiddle player. Fifth generation fiddle player, steel guitar player, guitar player. Beautiful voice, very talented guy. But she was very struck by him, as you know. She would talk about her Cherokee cousin. She was she would hurt, got hurt one time. They were down at the river. She said, and the, a big guy like Big Benny picked me up and carried me all the way to the house two miles. You know, it was probably 100 yards, but she saw it in her mind as he hauled her, and she, that was indelible for her. Um, she would talk about just, you know, being here, how much she loved the people here. These were her people. This was her land. Um you know, the, wrenched is a good word, as we said. She was wrenched out of here and taken out there. But she also loved the displaced people from here out there as much as she did the place here. I mean, she just adopted it as her new homeland. Mm-hmm. And the people that were out there from here were her people, just like they were here. There was no difference. She really bridged a gap because she was one of the last people I think left that actually remembered the journey. She was 17, and so she's gonna have a really good memory by then. Mm-hmm. Most of those people were too young. Most of the people that are left now alive today were too really either too young to remember it, or you know, they just there's very few of them left that made the trip, period. You know, those numbers are diminishing. But she really remembered it, and it was just so indelible with her the the living here and living there and knowing people in both places. Um, you know, I just think that left a huge imprint for her. And we're lucky to have her writing and her 
vision of it because she's one of the last that we can turn to for what was it like? Mm -hmm. You know, well, she can tell you mm -hmm. through her poetry. Mm -hmm. Do you think she's known in Oklahoma like she is in California? I don't think so. And that's what we're out to change now, Karen, isn't it? Yes, it is. We're going to change that because Wilma deserves to be heard here. Uh, she writes about you, Oklahoma, because she loves you. Uh, and she writes about a part of our history that is very important, a huge part of our It really defines us in a lot of ways. Uh, the migration to California, to the West Coast, um, to me it does. And for my grandparents' generation, not so much my parents, or not exactly for mine, but for just being in, from Oklahoma and Oki, you know, which my grandmother always found is a horribly derogative term. She didn't like it being used. And, you know, don't, you know, don't say that. And I was, you know, I wear it on my sleeve because I'm proud to be from here. Our, our people have endured a lot, have been through a lot, and, you know, we're everywhere. Do you think, how do you think she viewed the term? I think she viewed it like I did, as mm -hmm. like a badge of honor. Well, I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I absolutely think so. That all those people came to, because yeah, they're going to call us Okies. Well, by God, we are Okies, so here we are. Mm -hmm. What do you think now? <laughs> <laughs> was she outspoken about different topics in particular? Oh, she was very left. I don't think without being, she wasn't real political. But um, she was her. I think her politics would have been called. Um, what would it have been called? Oh, not socialist, but more. Um, what was it in the twenties? Populist. Populist government. Yeah, she was. I would call her a Will Rogers populist. Someone who believed in the working man and be, him being able to make a living in this country and have a right to say you know, a right to have a, uh, a say in how he's governed and how different things go. That was, that's a Will Rogers populist to me. And I think she's directly from that school. Uh, and without ever, she never professed politics to me other than she absolutely abhorred the war, the current war in Iraq when we were going in years ago, you know, when we could all see it. Um, but yeah, I think it was very populist with her. Will Rogers was her man. Was he? I think so. He yeah. Oh, she, oh yeah, it. she did talk about him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and of course, Wilma always identified herself with the musicians. She loved Burl Haggard. She loved Buck Owens. She loved uh, the Bakersfield guys. That's cause that's where she was from. When she landed there, they were there. Mm -hmm. uh, she loved Bob Wills. Bob Wills would come to California. Um, Buck Owens read one of her poems one night at his club, the, the Crystal Palace in Bakersfield, with her in attendance, and that was a big, that was a big deal for her. I mean, a really big deal for her. Mm -hmm. She talked about it for weeks, and <laughs> she should have. It was a proud moment. Um, so she told you that story. Oh yes. So she was. She liked being associated with the musicians and the the art from here, mm -hmm. which she considered from here. Buck Buck Owens was from Texas, of course, Merle. He's the Okie from Muskogee, born in California, but as he says, procreated in Oklahoma. Uh, so I think she had a strong identification with those guys. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I rambled on that, but I thought I would. Um, what did she look like, her appearance? Gosh, I only saw her once really in person. Mm -hmm. You know, the pictures, I think, uh, she just, I think... Was she a tall woman? No, nah, she was a pretty lanky. Was she, how tall was Wilma? Five, six, five, seven. She was pretty lanky. Uh, I think of, when I think of her appearance, it's more for me of a, a I don't want to say aura, but I mean, since I didn't see her, but I had that contact with her for so many years, the physical appearance didn't really matter mm -hmm. to me. I mean, I didn't even really think about her in those terms. She was just kind of a matriarchal love out there on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, I didn't really think of her in physical appearance terms. Mm -hmm. What what kinds of things made her laugh? What make what her laugh? Her? Oh, 
Did she laugh a lot when you talked to her? She did, and I'm trying to think of what she laughed at. A lot about her, at laugh at herself a lot. Because she was getting up in, in years and starting to, you know, physically break down. And so she would laugh at herself a lot. Oh, John, this happened, and I, I couldn't believe it. And I, you know, this and that. Uh, the folly of man. <laughs> I think she laughed at just us as people a lot. And woman. Um, you know, she just, <laughs> I don't know. I think uh, that's, not, uh, she would laugh a lot and I don't really remember what about a lot of times, but yeah, I think herself and just the folly of the human condition, mm -hmm. you know, do you know if she, um, if she saw movies or watched TV or listened to the radio? Um, I don't, I don't know what her media exposure was really. I know she liked to read stuff about herself. Although she she would she would play shy, she loved the adoration. Oh, did she? Oh yeah, very much so. She wanted to be fond of her, and she wouldn't say it. She wouldn't come right out and say it, but she really did want that, and she deserved that. Mm -hmm. You know, she should have with what she did. I'm glad she got a measure of that. Mm -hmm. I really am. Mm -hmm. But yeah, she wanted it. She liked the spotlight. Mm -hmm. so I mean, there's a picture in here of her with Buck, I think, singing to her or uh, if reading her poem, possibly. You know, she's like just eating it up, man. And that's good. That's a good picture. Yeah. So she sent you this. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That'll be in the archives. Okay. Maybe. Copy of it, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> Work something out. Okay. Um, okay, well, I hate, to, I hate to get to this point, but how, how did you learn of her passing? That hasn't been that long ago. It hasn't. Uh, Roxanne actually emailed me, and that's how I first heard about it. Um, and then it was kind of surprising. I started getting a few more emails from some people. Uh, a local writer here, friend of ours, John Woolley, was contacted by, he has a listener, he has a, a radio show that he does in Tulsa called Swing on This, uh, Swing, Western Swing, and some people had emailed him, do you know Wilma McDaniel? Um, and I started getting some, uh, well, some stuff started showing up in the newspapers here locally. The Oklahoma City paper had an article. The Tulsa paper had an article. I don't know if Stillwater did or not. I don't remember. But, uh, and I started getting correspondence. There was a woman in California, and I don't recall her name right now, but she actually acted as a, anything that came out on Wilma, she would email out to a list of friends. That, and I was, I, got, I was on that list. Mm -hmm. So some obituaries that started coming, we were asked to send in emails. I sent in a, a little email just about of our thoughts to be read at her, um, I guess at Memorial. Mm -hmm. They went to an Italian restaurant she liked somewhere and ate pasta, you mm -hmm. know, or pizza or something, drank beer and talked about Wilma. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, that's how I found out. And it was sad. You know, uh, I know she had to have s some pretty permanent care at the end as, you know, many people. So uh, she had good days and bad. And I didn't talk with her as much at the very end. I did talk with a, a friend. I think the, I can't remember the last time I talked to her, but she was the, a friend was there pretty much all the time at her home and saying they're going to have to move her to a facility. And uh, um, I really talked with the friend a little more than Wilma at the time, and she said she would have good days and bad, and she would often talk about back here. You know, she went to Oklahoma a lot as a, the time drew near. And, uh, you know, I, I wish I had had a little more contact, but I had some people say, and I, I don't know if Roxanne had any contact with her at the very end, but it became, you know, a little bit hard to carry on a conversation. Mm -hmm. Did you save a copy of what you sent in for the memorial service? I did. I'll have it on my email. Mm -hmm. I'll make sure that's included. <laughs> it was short. What, okay, what do you think, what should people in Oklahoma know about her? How should she be remembered? Uh, back here, Wilma should be remembered as um, a person who loved Oklahoma and the people from here. 
um, was taken from here at a very tender age, but kept her oakiness about her. Um, she just, she really cared for this place. And I think she shows us in her being displaced how rich and how good it really is here because she missed it so much. She reawakened in me about how cool this place really is and how great the people are and how great the land is. And it really is special. And I think Oklahomans have the worst, can sometimes have the worst opinions about themselves and their place. And they think if it's from here, it can't be, I don't know, somehow great or better, or it can't be that outstanding. Well, I got news for you folks, it is. It's a very unique place with filled with very unique people. Uh, uh, all you have to do is look at the impression that artists from this area have made on the world. The list goes on and on and on. And she's definitely one of them. So I think she should be remembered as someone who, just for me, and I think for everybody, if you study her work, will help you remember your oakiness. And you mean what by that when you say oakiness? Uh, mean plain you? spoken, honest, um, loving the land, feeling like you're a part of something from being from here. Um, that it is a special place mm -hmm. and it is to be treasured. Mm -hmm. It's not just to be overlooked and, oh, there's nothing to do there. Let's get out of there. There's lots to do here. All you got to do is look. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's a very special place and that's what she should be remembered for to me, reminding people of what's so special about Oklahoma because she was able to observe it as someone who lived here and then was forced from here. So she can look back at it and really say, look, this is what it is for me. You guys take a look because that's what it is there still. That's what it says to me mm -hmm. that's good. and what she says. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any final thoughts? Uh, was lucky to get to know her. It was great corresponding with her all those years. I'll carry Wilma with me all of my life. No doubt about it. She'll always be a part of, of my life. And I think our band as well. Our band was very impacted by a short meeting with someone who was very special. That's Has it. she influenced any of your songs? Uh, you know, I wouldn't say directly, but it's her presence will be on everything we do. I think, you know, in some form or fashion from now on just by the fact of what she did in reminding us of our oakiness. Mm -hmm. You know, that's who we are too, and proud to be that way. So yeah, I think she, although it's, there's not a direct contribution as far as a song or anything sp specific or particular, she'll be a part of what we do forever. Can't help it. Don't wanna. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Karen. Interview. Very thank nice. Thanks for sharing your memories. Okay, glad Thanks. to do it. <laughs>